So good morning, everybody. I'm um, Eric Van Gregory. Obviously, you've heard my name. I, I'm with CoData, which is the, the data arm of the International Science Council. And we were leading a, a project called World Fair. I'll give you a little bit of background on that. Um, I'm, I'm the chair of the CDIP working group. I have a background. I'm not an ontologist. OK, I have a background in metadata standards for many years. Um, but I, I've worked with a lot of ontologists, and so I'm going to try to keep this uh, uh, the presentation to a kind of a summary. Um, and hopefully, we have some time to discuss things and to take questions at the end. Um, so let me let me get started. Really quickly, World Fair was a project that just came to completion. Uh, the, I, I mean, I think we still have paperwork to do through September or something, but all the actual work is done. It was a two-year European project that made an exception to allow for international partners. And basically what we did, it was it was CoData and the Research Data Alliance with CoData really leading the project. Um, we had 11 different case studies in different domains looking at fair practice. So what does fair mean within each of these domains? And um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about sort of how we did that, but those case studies, we call them, produced the requirements which went into creating something that was cross-domain, which is the cross-domain interoperability framework that I'll talk about today. Um, so it was a two-year project. We just reached completion, but there will be another round of this project called World Fair Plus, which is not going to be uh, funded quite the same way. I'll give you a little more information on that too, but that's that hasn't started yet. So we're sort of presenting the outcome from the first round of the project now and looking towards launching the next one, um, starting probably uh, in the coming fall. Um, the deliverables from World Fair are available in the Zenodo community. There are 69 different documents there. Not all of them are, are substantive, but a lot of them are. Um, you may have seen the link to the CDIF document, which is one of them. There's a lot of good work that came out of this project. I, I've, I've worked in a lot of European projects over the years, and this was one of the more productive ones that I've seen, given the, the scale of funding. Um, but I, th I think if you spend some time on that Zenodo site, you'll, you'll see the kinds of things that came out of this. And different domains were focused in different areas, as you'd expect, which was quite interesting. Um, I'm not really here to talk about World Fair as a project, though, other than as background to CDIF. Um, and before I get into that, I really want to sort of give you uh, a perspective on FAIR. And obviously, everyone's heard of FAIR, and it's important to, to all of us in a lot of different ways. Ten years ago, they came up with the FAIR data principles. Now, I've been working in metadata standards for secondary use of data for, for more than two decades now. So the idea of FAIR, of sharing data and, and sharing resources, isn't actually new. But what the FAIR data principles did was start a revolution in our awareness of the need and the, and the value of doing it. And I can't emphasize enough how marked a change it was before and after FAIR came out. I mean, I'm sure everybody's engaged with FAIR. It's been 10 years now. But I really think that that was a, a huge inflection point. It was a revolution, if you will. And over the past 10 years, I see that as sort of an evolution in the thinking. People have been thinking hard about what data reuse requires in different scenarios, what kind of standards we need, what kind of technology we need, what are the approaches, how do we deal with semantics, all of the challenges that come with that. And a lot of that work has been research work and academic work. And we have a lot of very, very interesting prototypes and ideas on the table now. But the truth is, we still can't share data very well. And um, I feel like we've reached a point where we're, we deal with what I call the hard work of implementation. That if we're going to make this real, we have to implement these ideas. We have to agree on things and do the not sexy work of, of implementation. And it's expensive and it's slow. And it, isn't, it doesn't make your career as an academic, right? It's, it's, it's a different kind of, of undertaking. And CDIF is really part of that implementation phase. Um, it's, I'll talk a little bit more about what it is and it isn't, because I think it's important to be clear here. CDIF is not a research project. It is not research. It is an engineering activity, if you will. And the idea is that we need to take existing technology, we need to take existing approaches, existing standards, and be able to implement the FAIR vision in a practical way so that people can actually share research data and control vocabularies and ontologies and these kinds of things. It has to be made real. An idea that isn't implemented is just an idea, and, and we want a reality. So 
What we've tried to do with CDIF is to create guidelines for implementers, saying literally, if you want to enable your system to share data across domain boundaries and infrastructure boundaries, what are the practical things you have to do in order to make that a reality? And what we ended up with was essentially a, what I call a lingua franca, a common language for interoperability machine to machine for fair resources. And um, when you design such a thing, you need to make it implementable. It has to be stepwise so that you can do a little bit of implementation and get a little bit of benefit or a lot of implementation with a larger benefit. So it has to be something people can do in a progressive way because that's how organizations deal with technology. Um, CDIF is not a new metadata specification. We have a lot of standards already. It's not cool new technology. We're using existing mainstream technology as much as we can, very intentionally. So CDIF is not, um, it's not like a lot of other things in FAIR space. You may be familiar with the FAIR digital object framework. Really cool idea, really new idea. CDIF isn't like that. It's, it's, it's a much more um, conservative kind of thing in a certain way. It's focused on implementation. So I, I like to refer to that as an engineering perspective. Now, there is a very strong financial business case for FAIR, right? That PricewaterhouseCoopers did a report for the European Commission. In 2018, they estimated that the cost of not having FAIR data to Europe alone was 10.2 billion euros a year. Now, I'm sure that number would be bigger today. And when you multiply that by all of the continents in the world, that's a very, very big number. 80% um, of the research effort in, in cross-domain projects is spent data wrangling, 80%. And that's, that's ridiculous on the surface of it. Um, the link to the report is there. I'll, I'll send the slides in so they can be shared later. Um, that report is not very exciting reading, but it, it gives you a real perspective into why FAIR is important. So there's a very good business case for it. But if we want to look at it as an engineering problem, we have a different perspective. It's simple. Everyone should be able to discover and access and use everything else that's out there in the world that is related to research. And that should be regardless of the domain of origin or the domain of use. Um, that's a, a very glib way, a very easy way to state a very, very difficult problem, right? And when you really dig into it, you realize that this requires the massive standardization of metadata. And there's, there are lots of problems of scale here. And how do we get people to standardize their metadata and publish it all in the same way? How do we convince them to adopt these standards and do that it has to be voluntary. No one can do this by fiat. Um, and then there's the challenge of semantics, which is really the hardest problem here. And I think this group is probably keenly aware of that. But domain terminology is diverse, and we have to address that. And I'll talk about that problem specifically in a little more detail later in the presentation. The solution we came up with, though, is a pretty simple one. We looked around the world and we said, who else has networks that do similar things at a similar scale. Now, Google, when you look at Google, and this is pre-chat GPT Google, right? Before it started telling you to eat glue and jump off bridges. Um, Google was a really amazing tool for search. And how did they do that? They have a massive server farm that essentially runs a really, really large kind of limited knowledge graph because there's not a lot of, of, of metadata about things on the web. But there is some standard metadata, and they harvested that and did what mining they could and produced an amazingly large scale knowledge graph. Now, when you decide to, to apply that to something like research, you have a much narrower focus, but also problems of scale. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the o Oceans Info Hub. Um, I know we worked a lot with people from the Helmholtz Metadata Consor Consortium. You may be familiar with their work. They use a similar uh, approach in some of their guidelines, but they built themselves a knowledge graph with 200 institutions for oceans research. In, and um, they have a dashboard where you can find anything in that space. And they did it in a way that's very similar to what Google did. But this idea of building a large knowledge graph based on standard metadata actually is something that is a practical approach. And so that's what we're trying to do for everything. Okay, that's a little ambitious but it's a scalable approach and it's something that people understand and that works with existing technology and so we sort of went with that the idea is that every node in this graph so all of the fair data in all the domains should have a little bit of standard metadata sufficient to support some core functions it can't do everything that's impossible but what we can do is support some of the basics 
and I'll talk more about that. But the idea is that you need domain neutral standards expressed in a, a form that people can deal with. And we've realized that JSON LD was a big winner here. Everyone wants the, the richness and power of RDF, but actual engineers in the real world don't work very much with RDF. What they do work with a lot is JSON. And JSON LD bridges those two divides. It gives you the, the richness of RDF without a lot of the overhead of the, of the RDF information model. And so that seemed to us to be a winner. And then we have um, vocabularies like schema.org, like DCAP, like SCOS, like PROV, that are very, very um, web, web oriented, very widely used, domain neutral, that really met our criteria. So the idea was, can we take those things and build a, a, a knowledge graph on metadata contained in, common, in subsets of common vocabularies that support the key functions we need um, to do fair across domains? And that's what CDIF is, is that set of profiles and that set of functions. Um, so that's kind of the, the perspective that, that I'm giving you. And the, the big thing that is, the most difficult part of this is semantics. Every domain has specialized concepts. And sometimes those exist for very, very good reasons. And ontologists understand this probably better than anyone. Um, there, are, there are differences in the thinking in domains that are at the heart of, of what those domains actually are. Why, why they define things and think about things in the way that they do has to do with the science that they're conducting and the research they're conducting. Um, however, sometimes there are common things that are different for historical reasons, simply because they were developed in isolation. Every domain needed them, every do domain developed them, but they did it in isolation. So you have both very substantial differences and very, very trivial differences. And both of those things exist in a lot of ontologies, a lot of domain standards. Um, and the question is, can we map the core information across domains and more easily support the, the, the rationalization of the substantive differences? And that's a very, very difficult problem. Now, it turns out that structural and physical aspects of data, and a lot of this is what's needed for machine to machine communication, can be standardized. And that gets into even the structural and logical arrangement of data. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. The conceptual aspects uh, very often cannot be mapped easily. That requires some form of intelligence because those mappings are dependent on the context of use, on the origin of the data and what its scientific purpose was. And there's a lot of nuance in those kinds of mappings between concept, concept systems. Um, and so we tried to separate those things in CDIF because We've seen this work in other areas. Uh, there's a, a, a standard architecture and, and um, a metadata standard called the, the Statistical Data and Metadata Exchange. And they very intentionally and cleanly separated the technical architecture from the semantic parts of it. Now, they, don't, they aren't really into ontology in that world, in the official statistics world, but they are very into formal concept definition. And they realized that if you agree on the plumbing and everyone does the same technical things, that makes the conceptual problems easier to solve. And that's a non-obvious approach, but it worked very, very well for a large scale network in SDMX. And this is all of the official economic and um, uh, uh, statistical policy data at the international level, it uses that standard framework for exchange and it works very well. But the key was they separated the concepts from the, te from the technical frame that the concepts are exchanged in. The web gives us a little bit of that, but not quite enough for real interoperation. So that's the hard problem. I want to talk a little bit more about mapping standards because a lot of people think about FAIR and say, oh, we'll just map all the domain standards against all the other domain standards and the problem will be solved. Turns out that that approach is basically a non-starter because of issues of scale. When you think about the number of standards and the number of functions performed, and I, I'm not talking just about ontology here, I'm talking about the whole technology stack. Um, mapping every domain standard against every other domain standard in a case where you want to exchange information produces an absolute mass. It's possible to do things that way, but it's incredibly expensive and wasteful. And this approach has been used in other domains. I worked in the 90s in international supply chain, and there were dedicated commercial networks that did nothing but transform dialects of, quote, standard business um, transactions between large companies. And the amount of money they spent mapping those transactions and doing the, doing all of that work was incredible. Um, you look at the web and everybody agrees to use a core set of standards for basic stuff. That's a much better model. And so 
The idea of CDIF is to, is to not use the many-to-many -many model, but try to use a many-to-one model where we had a common language for basic core things and then do the point-to-point the -point mappings where they're absolutely necessary. Um, it makes the problem of mapping and, and semantic translation much more tractable. Okay, and that's, that's at the heart of how CDIF is designed. Um, I want to talk a little bit historically about how we developed CDIF. Um, we, we were one of those core uh, uh, work packages in World Fair. We had each of the 11 case studies do what's called a fair implementation profile, which was a brief set of questions characterizing the current state of play and the intended practice within the domain around fair. And domain by domain, that is very different. But that created a body of requirements for us to take on board as we developed CDIF. And then we worked further with each of the uh, case studies, looking at those requirements and looking at CDIF and, and what it needed to do for them. We then convened a group of 30 volunteers from different FAIR initiatives, from different standards bodies, and um, split them into a working group and an advisory group. The working group met twice monthly throughout the entire project, more than that actually with a lot of side meetings in order to produce the draft that we have today, which is about 150 pages of, of, of recommendation. And it's, it's pretty detailed if you've had a chance to look at it. There's a lot more work to be done, but it's, I think, a respectable initial draft. The advisory group sort of answered questions and, and performed reviews, but it was a lot of work from volunteers and some very, very um, uh, expert, really well-respected experts, I have to say. Um, there's the Zenodo link if you haven't seen it already. And I'm going to talk a bit more now about the core profiles and the direction of further work. Also, a little bit more about World Fair Plus, which is currently in the planning stages and organizational stages. And I, I'd love to recruit some people from NDFI into that work. Um, and we've already started sort of doing that, and I can mention that a bit. Um, here's the, di the picture that, that they drew for us of the, of the core profiles. Really, the functions that we're looking at here are discovery, access, how you express controlled vocabularies, and I'll talk more about what I mean by that in a minute, and how you describe data so that it is ready for integration. FAIR talks about interoperable data and data reuse, and that means integrating or harmonizing data, um, but you can't know what somebody else will do with your data in future. All you can do is describe it so that it's ready for them to do it, and that's already a big challenge. Um, so those were the core areas, and I'll go through those in a little more detail. You can see some of the standards we ended up recommending in each of those boxes. We also made some recommendations about universals, time, geography, and unit of, units of measurement that don't really need, um, that they, they uh, are used in different standards and different profiles. So that's not a profile in and of itself, but it is a set of recommendations about how to address those very common and important topics for data integration. Um, the way it works is this. You decide which of these profiles you want to support based on the functions that you, are important to you, and then you create a, a set of JSON-LD metadata declarations in the appropriate vocabularies and mix of vocabularies, and then you publish that either embedded in a web page or as a standalone JSON-LD file that is advertised on a website in some standard ways. We do signposting, we use robots.txt files, things like that, but standard web approaches. Um, the only real dependency between the profiles is that when you're describing data, you may need to refer to controlled vocabularies to define the concepts for things like the fields in your data um, and the, represent, the ways that the data is represented, so categorical definitions and so on. Um, so the, the structural aspects are separate from the semantics, and you can already see that in the way the profiles are, are, are divided up. We're going to extend this work in a, a, a number of different areas. We have these core profiles, but there's also an idea that as we get more agreement, better um, uh, vocabularies in the access space, things like um, uh, legal frameworks, access conditions, and so on, as there's more commonality in terms of standards there, we can use the ODRL, for, ODRL framework in a much more powerful way. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, what we recommend today is, is much more limited because we don't have agreement on things uh, important to access. Um, when you get into actually describing data integration, which is important in, in understanding the provenance of some data sets, you have to be able to describe mappings between ontologies. You may be familiar with ESSEM, um, which is sort of a, a starting point for that work. There's a lot of work around provenance that's a very complex and not very clear practice, and we need to do more work there. 
There's an idea of context, which is describing the dependencies between fields and data that result from things like experimental design and a lot of information you lose when you go across domains that is known within domains that needs to be made explicit. And um, so there's a number of areas that we need to expand into, and I'll talk more about that. But we have, um, CDIF is far from done, basically. We have some core things out there in the first draft, and we know that there's more work to be done. That, this slide sort of shows that, how we, how we expect that to look. Here are the initial profiles. Um, for discovery, we're really using a core set of schema.org fields, but we recognize that DCAT is a standard that cannot be ignored in this space and is in some ways much better suited to describing data because that's what it's designed for. So we basically say that you can use a, set, a, a limited set of schema.org fields and we provide sort of required ones and optional ones and talk about what they should be populated with and then say DCAT is an acceptable alternative with a recognized mapping, which is the one that is put out by the W3C committee that produced DCAT. Um, and those links are in the draft. Um, the idea is to support search and cataloging. These are basic functions everyone needs to do to make fair work. Um, it, we support the publication of controlled vocabularies in a limited way insofar as that is necessary. Now, there's a lot of work in FAIR around um, semantic artifacts, particularly ontologies, and CDIF does not want to do that work. It wants to reference that work when, it, when it's done. And you may know more about that than I do. Um, one of the guys in the, in the working group, Jan Lafranc, may be a familiar name. He's very active in FAIR Impact and some other areas. And he was, he was part of the work there and is, is one of our people. Um, focused on that, but we feel like that's still something that where more work needs to be done. But um, the idea that controlled vocabularies have to be published as important fair resources is right front and center. And we do support that in the initial draft to a limited extent. ODRL is a framework that does not is not specific to research data at all. It's used a lot in things like the, the publication of MP3 files and MP4 files and charging and, and rights and things like that in other industries. It's basically a framework for describing actions of access and conditions of use. And it's a great framework. We describe in the draft how ODRL could be used for FAIR resources. Um, the problem is we don't have agreement on a lot of, of the terms and standard uh, vocabulary we need for describing access. <clears throat> Every domain does this differently. There's a lot of work going on now within the FAIR community. Um, some of you may know Luis Benino from Twente in, in the Netherlands. He's been working um, as an example with Mark Wilkinson, who you may know from FAIR things, on describing legal conditions and a, a, a fundamental sort of ontology for those kinds of resources that have to be in place for ODRL to really work at scale across a large network. And there are other people focused on different aspects of that problem, things like the data privacy vocabulary. Um, but until that work is done, it's fairly limited what you can do with ODRL, and we've tried to lay that out in the draft. For controlled vocabularies, we, we really wanted to say, okay, everyone should use OWL, but it turns out that in a lot of domains, ontology is not, OWL is overkill for them. They, they cannot do it, it's simply asking too much. What we did realize though, is that we can get people to do SCOS and that it's possible to do a limited representation of an ontology in a SCOS form sufficient for descriptions of data and then to link that to the, to the richer ontology if necessary. Um, that's a non-ideal solution, but it's an acceptable one in reality. Um, and SCOS is so widely used that we ended up saying do SCOS. And then um, some of you may know um, Pierre-Luigi uh, Buttigieg, I never pronounced his name right. He worked a lot with the Helmholtz Metadata Consortia and was involved in the OCEAN's work. Um, and he, he helped us a bit and wrote part of the text here talking about the relationship between SCOS and OWL. So some of them may, that may not be news to you guys. There's also an extension to SCOS called XCOS for statistical classifications. There's a lot of um, valuable controlled vocabularies coming out of the world of official statistics, and that's an extension of SCOS that they use a lot. So we also said for that specific purpose, that may be something that's a value, but it's just an extension to SCOS. Um, for data description, we had a really hard time finding good vocabularies, and we ended up with something coming from the Data Documentation Initiative, which is a social science standard body that had the problem of cross-domain data description. So they, they developed a vocabulary based on things like CSV on the web, frictionless data, that um, it's basically its own standard that describes the structural aspects of text-based data formats. 
if I want to describe a CSV file full of data, how do I describe its structural organization and the roles played by different concept definitions and semantics vis-a-vis -vis that structure? Because there's a lot of defaulting and, and um, implicit knowledge baked into the structure of data in terms of how the concepts interact with it and are used to describe it. And that's what DDI CDI is designed to bring to surface. It's, um, a, it's a very complicated model that we've had to do a, a very minimal subset of for our purposes. But this is maybe the more complicated part of, of what's in CDIF because describing data at the field level requires a lot of metadata. And you wanna know what are the fields, how are they typed, how do they relate to concepts, what is the logical structure so that you can rip it apart and re recombine it in the form needed for your integration, even though it's published and described in a different form. And that becomes one of the big challenges that we tried to address in CDIF. Um, and I'll go into that and give you an example of one of the tools that we prototyped to sort of explore this. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have some recommendations around time and geography and units of measure. And that's not gonna come as a huge surprise, I think, to anybody. Um, I wanna go briefly through the additional topics that we look at. Um, we discuss these in the initial draft. We give some pointers to, to what our thinking is, but we do not make recommendations for practice at this point. When you look at provenance, prov is obviously the elephant in the room, but what do people do with prov? They tend to extend it for specific purposes in specific domains, and there are a lot of extensions. Um, DDI-CDI also talks about process and does an implementation of prov. Prov1 does this for certain kinds of research in social science. You have things like SDTL and SDTH that are using it to do very, very specific um, querying on, on processing scripts exposed in a, 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 uh, a platform neutral way. There are also things that aren't prov related like the common workflow language. So there are lots of standards out there that are good for describing processing and those aspects of provenance. And it's, there is no single practice that we can recommend at this point, but we know that there's more work to be done there. We also have the challenge of looking at full data lineage. So I have some data, you use it, um, you integrate it with your data and you produce a new data output that someone else uses to integrate with their data to produce a new output and so on. How do we describe the entire chain of data lineage so that we really understand where data comes from? This is a massive challenge for FAIR. And some of the work in FAIR impact in EOSC life particularly has highlighted the, the problem here. We don't have a good solution yet. It kind of looks like blockchain, honestly. Um, but we need to solve that problem if we really want to get a handle on provenance. It's a, it's a big problem that is very poorly addressed today. Um, we know there's a lot of work there. We're looking a lot at, at data, semantic mapping. And um, if you work with the Oboe Foundry stuff, you may be familiar with ESSEM. Everybody who looks at the space ends up saying, yeah, ESSEM is a great place to start. The problem is it doesn't solve the entire set of issues. And there's a new working group in RDA that was started by, uh, you may know a guy named Volmar, I can't, don't remember his last name. He's with Elixir and Jan Lafranc. Um, I think they were, are the chairs of the RDA group that just started up. It's very new. I'll, I'll give you a link to their YouTube video in a minute. Um, the intention in CDIF is to, is to align with the work coming out of that group because a lot of the other FAIR initiatives are getting together on this topic in that forum. Um, in terms of data context and variable dependencies, there's a lot of work going on here. I'm not going to go into detail on this, but if you know um, SOSA SSN or, or the observation measurement specification from um, OGC, if you're familiar with RDA iAdopt, there's a lot of work that's been done in that area that we're trying to benefit from. We have to look at describing samples and collection events and a lot of things important in research that end up having um, being reflected in the data in ways that are non-obvious. And there's no good standard for describing that stuff. Now, there are lots of, of sort of bits and pieces on the table, if you will. We need to look at AI. Um, I'm not gonna say too much about this. We know this is gonna have a huge impact on us. How do we describe provenance for AI? That's a huge problem. Um, how do we make our data best fit for training large language models. You may be familiar with a thing called Croissant that's coming out of Google and some other groups that have produced a, a sort of mini standard. That looks very intriguing. It looks a lot like how we describe data for CDIF. Can we just better describe fair data for training large language models? And we think that's a possibility. Um, we'll get less hallucination if we have better data going into these things. Um, how do we package things? You may be familiar with RO crates, it's very popular. 
Um, the FDO framework can be implemented that way. So we have some ideas there that we need to explore further. And then we need to look at a lot of different kinds of data. The current crop of um, recommendations only deals with things like CSV and ASCII uh, delimited formats and, and fixed width formats, because that's the bulk of the data on, that's out on the web today for fair use. However, what do you do about Parquet? What do you do about NetCDF? What do you do about HDF5? What do you do about things described in DataCube? There are lots of other ways of describing data that are not covered by the current recommendations, and, we, and we're keenly aware that we need to expand that coverage. So that's something we'll be looking at more. Um, I want to talk now. So that, that's a quick summary of what's in the spec. And you can read, if you, if you have the time, read all 150 pages, and, and we're happy to take input. This is a draft. It's not cast in stone. It's a first take. Um, but I want to talk a little bit now about a couple of the hard problems. And the first one of these is describing data to make it integration ready. Because semantic mapping is great, but it has to be done in the context of working with data. And that means that you need to understand the structures of the data that you're, that you're applying the semantic mappings to. So the first really complicated challenge for CDIF was that data description. And um, you, you can never completely automate, I think, maybe with artificial intelligence, we'll get closer, um, a data transformation. There's always intelligence involved in that process of some form. Even when you've described the mappings between standard vocabularies, even when you've described the structural and format mapping. Um, but you can do a much better job of it than we do today. And this is hugely expensive in research. And we should automate this to the extent possible. One of the pushbacks that we get a lot of times is that people don't want to describe their data at the field level. They say it's too expensive, it's too complicated. Um, they do this in a lot of domains, but those standards tend to be very domain specific. So I want to show you something. Let me see if this link will work. Um, um, yeah, there we go. Okay, so can you see this? This is a little um, throwaway prototype. It's a, it's a client-side JavaScript application that we wrote in two days. Took a couple of developers to hack this together. And we wrote it for a guy at the UN Statistics Division who was working with the Sustainable De Development Goal Indicators. He was one of the guys in the CDF panel. And he was working with the disaggregations. He wanted to get them into Google data comments. Okay. And he decided to use CDF as a vehicle for taking their, their CSV data, which is um, multi dimensional, and um, introducing that into Google Data Commons. So he wanted some code samples. And so we took an early profile of the CDIF data description in CDI, and we wrote this tool. And what it does is it takes a CSV file, it mines the structural metadata, and then presents the user with a simple wizard for adding the intelligence that isn't clearly present in the CSV file. So here are some examples that we preloaded. I'm going to take a file from the Statistics Canada website about juvenile crime in Canada. And just a little bit of a file, and I'll show you the CSV. But I click on that, and what have I done? I've taken this CSV file. I, I'm, I'm hearing that the, the link is kind of slow. Can you see this? Um, yes, we, yes, we can see, super, thanks. Super exciting, it's a CSV file. We know what these look like. And this is a little data cube, okay? And it, it talks about the number of, of juvenile offenses in Canada based on year and defense and, and offense and, and province. Okay, so it's a simple kind of cube. And what's happened is there the script has mined that CSV file and written a bunch of JSON LD declarations according to CDIF that describe the structure of that data. What are the columns? What are the fields? What, are, what do we know about the columns? Um, it looks at the values in each of the columns in that CSV file, and then it presents this little wizard. And this wizard says, okay, I've got four columns here. The first one has a label, offense. What is the definition of that? And I can say, oh, uh, the, the, the criminal offense, blah, 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 blah. I can fill in a, a little bit better description there. And if I look, and then I can say, what role is that playing in terms of the cube? And the, the people who, who work with this data, under they think in terms of data cube, honestly. They're SDNX people. And they say, oh, that's a dimension. And they say, it, it's, um, it's a text, but it's actually a code. And if I have a code, what, what were the codes? And can I add some information? These might be numbers or letters, and I need to add labels to them to make them meaningful. So I'm giving you the minimum metadata to honestly produce SCOS. Okay, and if I go down here and look in my JSON LD 
as I filled that out, it started producing the SCOS concept scheme for me, right? And as I add information to that little wizard, it will auto generate the JSON LD that I need for CDIV. I have year, and this would be the time period, but however I'd define that. Also a dimension, it's, it's not um, just a double, it's actually, a, it's, it's, a, it's a date. It's an ISO date, it's not coded. I have geography, I could, I could tell you of the province in Canada. That's textual, but it is coded. So again, another SCOS code list. The only value I have in my data here is actually Canada, but I could break that up by province in the full data set. Total number of cases, and this is also a dimension. The total number of cases is not a dimension. In this case, it's a measure. And it's an integer, it's not coded. And I could add sort of more information about that if I needed it. So um, what happens here is I now have the JSON LD I need to embed, embed in that in my landing page or, or otherwise on my website. I can save off that file or copy it and use it. That exercise took me, what, five minutes, not even. And if I wanted to fill in all the definitions, it might take an hour. But um, this gives you the minimum structural description of the data file. Um, and points you off to SCOS so that these things can be introduced into a, some kind of a meaningful knowledge graph, right? That is what is required for what we're doing. Um, and I think that that is, gives you an instant feel for the kinds of structural description that DDI CDI provides. Um, you can play with this and take a look at it. That profile is not the current profile in the draft, but I think the tool is pretty good for showing you what's necessary. With that minimum information, I can then get into the business of actually reusing semantic definitions via SCOS to begin to integrate data and to do my mappings. And so this lays the groundwork for actually doing a semantic mapping. But that's complicated. And I think you guys understand this. Mappings are done at different levels. We have the actual semantic mapping. What are the concepts? How do they relate? Am I taking categories and splitting and joining them? Are, are they partitive? A lot of people using SM use the uh, SCOS relationships for this. XCOS gives you a richer set taken from models for official statistics maintenance. Um, there are a lot of different relationship sets that you can plug into something like SM for describing how these, how the, the meanings are related. Um, but you also have mappings that are actually algorithmic. You have pr little bits of processing code. There are lots of ways of doing this, but in order to make that meaningful, you have to think about the representation of those semantics in the data and how that's processed. And then you have to look at the syntax of the data and how to implement those, the mappings between those representations. So this is a multi-level process. And SM gives you the top level, gives you kind of the second level a little bit, and that's where it stops. Um, the problem of data integration requires that we actually implement the mappings on the data. We don't stop with just the semantics. So from a fair perspective, we have to supply all of this. Now, the group that's really looking hardest at this is this new RDA group. And the RDA website is, is currently undergoing a revision. This group doesn't ap appear when you Google it. If you go and watch that YouTube video, that is Jan Lafranc talking about that group at, at the Birds of a Feather meeting in the Salzburg RDA last fall, where, where it was initially, where they launched the group. Um, if you know Jan Lafranc, he's, he's a great guy. If you contact him, he can put you in touch with the group itself or, or Vomar from Elixir. Um, but I, I strongly recommend getting in contact with those people if you're not already. It's a, it's a, it's a really good group of folks. And I think they're, they're, to my mind, the best place in FAIR to, to begin to address these problems at a, a global way. The, the, they're going to be the forum where, where all the ideas get exchanged, as far as I can tell right now. Um, there's a lot of people working on this problem, obviously, and a lot of people that we need to involve in that discussion, but I think that's a, a good forum. I want to talk a little bit, um, and yes, Joel, they are, they are working on all those three levels. Their first act, as far as I can tell, is to look across use cases and try to identify the different types of mapping, and there are more than just those three levels, but I stole that actually from a slide that Jan Lafranc uh, produced for a workshop that we did uh, on CDIF, actually. So, um, but definitely, they'll be looking at, at, at that plus. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening with CDIF now, and I'm nearly done with the presentation here. The idea is to build on existing networks. So we're working as an example with, with Otis, which was a work package 11 in World Fair, to make them CDIF compliant so that we have the sort of oceans um, domain graph, and then to try to connect that to other graphs like the Pacific Data Hub, which is related to, to the Sustainable Development Goal indicators for island nations, lots of economic data, lots of 
things like education and um, and not not hardcore science, but more official statistics policy data. Because if you live in an island nation that's going underwater, understanding the economic impacts of like sea like uh, ocean level rising are super important. And yet there's no single good way to query for that kind of data right now. So we want to start connecting some of these graphs using implementations of CDIF as initial um, steps, but to build on these existing networks as much as we can. Um, we want to work more with the official statistics community. Some of you may be familiar with VocBench. Um, we're in touch with a group at Eurostat and the commission that produced VocBench. And um, there's a, lot of, a very active group at FAO. They have a thing called Caliper. Um, people at the UN Statistical Division are very, very interested in uh, surfacing some of the official statistics vocabularies as SCOS. And um, so we're trying to align with them and work with them so that we have official classifications and research classifications available for use by everyone in this common form. Um, we've we've been working a bit with Helmholtz and, and NFDI. Um, I'm presenting to you today because of, of Heike from, from Daphne. I, don't ask me your acronym, Heike. Um, anyway, we, we put in a bid for Oscar. Um, we're looking at, at initially high value data um, and talking to tools vendors like Dataverse and some other people. I, I'm not going to go into that too much. Our next step is to put the recommendations, this 150 page PDF out in a form that can actually be used by developers. We have a GitHub, but we really need to, to get our web presence together. We want to do some conformance tools testing with Shackle. Um, and then we want to continue the work. And I'm really, really interested in engaging with NFDI, however that's meaningful to you guys. And we should talk about this further um, with, based on this background. Um, we're still organizing this effort. We have some projects in hand. We have some uh, funding proposals out there. Um, we'd love to discuss this further if you guys have ideas about how you could engage with this work. Um, so that's it for me. Sorry, I took a little longer than I intended. Um, I guess I, if we can open up the floor. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you, thank you very much.